everybody. Welcome to our second fireside chat. I'm Heather Jassy. I'm Senior Vice President of Members and Community here at Etsy. Um, so uh, as I said last time with the fireside chats, these are really just part of a series of some new ways we're launching to connect with our community. We'll be doing these every other week. We're taking questions directly from the community. Um, in an ideal world, we would do these in real time, but we need to get the right people in the room to be able to answer your questions. Um, we did hear your feedback on the audio quality. Thanks for all the combos on that, y'all. Um, so we have we have a different way of doing this today, so um, we'll watch for your feedback on that as well. Um, I do want to give a verbal disclaimer that anything discussed is um, true and accurate as of today. However, if you view this in the future, you may want to check in because some, of, some information may have changed. Um, so today we're covering our work on seller tools in 2015 and also want to give more perspective on how we think about buyer experience and testing, and I know these are topics that are near and dear to Etsy sellers' hearts. Um, and we were all told to wear bright colors today. Um, we'll, we'll call it a Halloween theme, I guess. Um, so I just want to start by introducing our guest. Would you two introduce yourself? Uh, tell Sorry. us a little bit about what you do at Etsy. So my name is Nikki Scarstead, and I am a group product manager here at Etsy. I work on Etsy's seller experience team. And so the seller experience team is a product team a group of engineers and product designers and uh, product managers, and we work on essentially all the tools that sellers use every day when they're managing their online shops. Can you give some examples? Sure, so things like shop stats is a favorite, um, shop dashboard, listings manager, listings process, I could go on and on and on, <laughs> there are a lot of tools. Great, and I'm Nick Daniel, and I'm the uh, director of product for buyer experience, so Nikki focuses on the seller side and I focus on the buyer side. Um, we build the buyer facing portion of the website that allows people to uh, actually find the products they're interested in buying and um, purchase them. Cool. So Nikki, you were actually an Etsy seller before coming to Etsy. I was. So I, I sold vintage for a few years um, and then eventually moved over to handmade and now my shop's on vacation. I'm a slacker, but I've got a really good idea, which I don't want to say here, but coming soon. We'll be watching for it. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what was your most memorable Etsy purchase? I do think. Can you go first? Sure. I um I actually just bought some earrings from a, a company in Brooklyn called Hook and Matter, mm -hmm. and um, it was uh, very memorable for me because it was a present for my wife, and I had forgot to buy it. And thanks to the pilot we're running in New York called Etsy ASAP, I was actually able to get uh, what to her seemed like a very thoughtful, well planned out gift uh, in a matter of hours. Very so. good. Um, my favorite, my, my favorite purchase actually isn't a purchase. I'm lying a little bit, but it was a gift that I received um, from an Etsy seller. Her uh, shop name is Pink Cheek Studios, and she sells felted uh, figurines that are customized. And so I got it as a wedding gift. Um, so it's my husband and myself in like our wedding day finery, so and cute. it's a mobile and it's adorable. It hangs on my wall, and I love it. Uh, so Nikki, I've got some questions for you first. So we, we took both questions that were posted on social, but also some common seller questions that we hear. Um, let's see, uh, Julie of Diva Vita Designs in Texas said, what happens to feature requests and suggestions made by sellers? How do you prioritize development resources? Sure, so that's a good question, Julie. Um, so what we do is we, we listen to feedback um, and feature requests from sellers. Um, in a number of different ways. So there's a lot of different channels of feedback that my team is reading almost every day. Um, things like the forums or teams, uh, we read kind of through recent posts and things like that. Um, we also spend a lot of time um, going out and talking to sellers in their studios. Um, so we um, call them studio visits, which is this will arrange uh, time with the seller and we'll actually go visit them and kind of watch them work in the shop, hear from them kind of what they would like to change on the site. Um, send out a lot of surveys, um, and I can really like go on and on and on. We do prototype teams, um, but basically we have a lot of these channels that we're kind of aggregating all of this feedback from sellers. And then how we prioritize the feedback is basically what we do is we use, and this is gonna get kind of nerdy here for a second, so follow okay. along with me. Um, we use a, basically kind of like a task management system called Jira, um, and we create tickets for all of the feedback that we get from sellers. And then um, we do a lot of research on the feedback that we get. So if someone will ask for something specific, say, in the listings manager, we really figure out, okay, how many sellers would be able to use this? Yeah. Is it going to be impactful? Um, could it potentially hurt the workflows of these sellers? We just kind of do our due diligence, um, write everything up, put it into our ticket um, and our ticketing system, 
And then we prioritize other things based on impact, the number of sellers it could help, um, and things like that. So we're kind of constantly doing a dance between um, you know, fixing some of the current tools we have on the site as well as building new things that we think could add value to sellers as well. Cool. I think um, you know, one question I get from a, a lot from sellers is why did you choose to prioritize this thing over something else? And I think one of the things that's hard for us to give sellers visibility into is that we have a number of teams who are doing different things and some teams may be working on something sellers want that may take two years to build sure. while other teams are doing things that are quicker to ship and so it's it's hard to really it's not that we're choosing one thing over another but the different teams are working off of different right. maps at and, any given time. yeah and sometimes things seem, seem really really simple to execute on um when in fact it actually would take a huge rewrite that would take months and months and months of time um so we're kind of trying to figure out like how much time things would take and then the impact as well yeah i always I know I frustrate engineers sometimes because I'll say, just copy and paste the whole thing <laughs> yeah. and do a new one. And totally. It's, they yeah. like when you say It doesn't like actually that. work yeah. like that, yeah. I've learned. Um, let's see, so do you have an example of some of the hands-on research that you and your team have done? Definitely. Um, so one, one recent thing we did um, uh, in lieu of some changes we were making to the orders pages, or the sold orders pages is a place basically where sellers go and they're managing all of the orders that they have in their shop is we went out and we went and did a number of studio visits and really watched. Um, we watched orders come into a seller's shop and then we watched them go through like every single step of their process of fulfilling the order. And it was really interesting um, to see not only how different workflows change for different sellers. Um, you'd be surprised, you know, I think a lot of people think um, all of our sellers are the same, but really people are running very different businesses and their processes and how they make items are completely different. Um, so we saw a number of different sellers um, just in their sort of like step by step when they were um, fulfilling orders and learned a lot uh, that we could apply to a future product project. And we do things like that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the listings manager I would like to, um, but basically we, uh, for the listings manager project, spent a ton of time doing studio visits as well and then put things into the prototype team um, so we could get feedback on sellers, um, from sellers when they were actually using the feature as well. I think the prototype team so great yeah we get really positive feedback from people the best. Love participating in that um, let's see I mean what do you hear from sellers the most about what they need for their shops so one I would say that the most common feedback that we get that's kind of like generalized a little bit is they want they want things to be faster and easier which is super simple right um, you know running a small business you wear a lot of hats and so you're doing a lot of different and when things are, especially when it comes to like tools or their workflow, when there's something that just takes a little bit more time than it should, um, we often hear um, frustration from sellers. You know, why is why does this take so long? Can this be faster? Uh, so one of my team's big um, initiatives and something we think about for every single project is how can we make it faster and easier and really fix some of the friction points uh, that are in certain seller processes. Yeah. And I think it's something we talk about a lot internally is you know freeing up more time to do whatever somebody wants to do in their shop. So if someone's a ceramicist, they probably want to spend more time throwing pottery and less time, you know, dealing with the shop. Right, right. exactly. You know, the, and something I think that's difficult there, though, is, um, as you said, every seller is unique, right? And you're trying to create tools that uh, may feel one size fits all, but they don't actually fit everybody. So you have to balance this tension between, like, making something that's super basic that actually satisfies the, the needs of like 80% of people or making something that's super custom that would satisfy all the needs but might be too difficult for the basic people to use. Totally, and that's, a, we fall back again like on all the research methods that we use when we're in the, the product development process. Um, and that's why we do prototype teams and we send out surveys and we talk to sellers and we do studio visits yeah. and we take, you know, we listen to the emails that they send into member operations um, because we have to be really careful when we are building things that, you know, works for that brand new seller who has, you know, maybe two listings for sale, but it also scales all the way up to somebody who's selling, you know, full time on Etsy and has thousands of listings. And the more you sell, the more acutely you feel any friction in the process yeah. too. Uh, let's see, so so what are you most proud of that your team built in 2015? Yeah, so there's a couple things. Uh, so we launched, I mentioned the listings manager before, I'm going to probably talk about, I always want to come back to this one because it was a good example of like a pretty complicated project. Um, so we launched that in February of this year, and basically what that was is just a rebuild of the listings manager, which is the page that sellers use um, basically when they see a library of all the listings for sale. And then the listings process, which is where they create a product to actually sell on the site. Um, and we made, we got a ton of feedback from sellers on a lot of different places in that whole experience that just weren't working. 
and it it made us decide that we were going to completely gut and rebuild that entire experience. Mm -hmm. And we spent a lot of time in the prototype team, um, nine months in fact with sellers. Uh, by the time we launched the listings manager, we had over ten thousand sellers in prototype. Wow! So it was just making sure again, like what you said, Nick, is just um, all the different types of sellers who were going to use those new tools. Just getting feedback from a huge swath of people, mm -hmm. um, and then we launched it. And I think it really did add a lot of value to a lot of people. Um, so Nick, your turn. Um, tell us a bit more about what your team does. Yeah, so like I said, we look at the, um, we focus primarily on the buyer side of things. So while Nikki's team is focusing on creating the tools and uh, processes that you need to run your business and to get your listings into Etsy and for sale, we look at the, um, we look at the buyer side. So we're looking at uh, what are the buyer's expectations when they come to Etsy and how do we provide them with an experience that meets that ex their expectations? Ultimately, the goal on our side is to connect buyers with the listings that they're interested in purchasing because that generates sales for our sellers and sales for Etsy. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's particularly hard at Etsy, but something we've talked about a lot is that I think you know when artists make something, they think in terms of material. So they're looking for a, a leather-wrapped crystal on a certain type of chain, and that's not necessarily how buyers are searching for that thing. Right. So there's this really intricate translation process that right. has to happen. Um, so can you talk us through what you decide or how you decide what you're going to work on? Yeah, for sure. So like I said, um, we focus mostly on buyers and uh, the way that we the way that we, we choose what to work on is based on the impact it can have on buyer behaviors and the buyer behaviors that we're looking to change. Um, so sometimes we're looking at things like favoriting rates or uh, the amount of times that people add things to the cart. Mm -hmm. But the thing that we consider ourselves uh, with primarily is conversion rate, and for people who are, uh, like are unfamiliar with conversion rate, it's just a measure of how many people purchase something they, uh, over how many people actually came to the site. So if you have 50 people buy something out of 100 visits, the conversion rate is 50 percent. And the reason that we focus on conversion rate is again that's where our sellers are making money, right? So the more we can do to improve the buyer experience, to increase the conversion rate, the more sales it generates for our sellers and more sales that generates for Etsy. See, okay, so uh, you two have mentioned testing just a little bit. Um, testing is controversial. Uh, you know, <laughs> have a lot of questions about testing. So, yeah. I mean, let's let's talk about testing. What? Why do we do testing? Um, just tell us a little bit more about how you think about testing. Sure. So, um, so Nikki's team uses prototypes more frequently than on like live testing, like we do on the site on the buyer side. Uh, but there's a really good reason why we do testing. Uh, it can seem haphazard and frustrating for our sellers, but uh, I'll explain all the motivation here. Um, so uh, our job on the buyer side is to understand what our buyer's expectations are. And in order to understand where we're either meeting those expectations or where we're not, we do a lot of user research. And during that user research, we probe the buyers, a lot of them who are new buyers to the site, on what could we be doing better, right? Where could this experience be better? How could we better connect you with the items you're looking for? Um, and through that process, we uncover needs, unmet needs. We then take those needs and we sit down and think about, well, if this is the need, what features can we add to the site which will actually fulfill those needs um, and hopefully make this a better marketplace for everybody? Um, but because we're coming up with the ideas and they're just ideas on what we could do to fulfill that need, we, we, we don't want to just release new features out on the website, right? Um, we want to make sure that we can test. And because the do. impact on sales for Yeah, sellers right. So what if we have an idea yeah. and like we know what the need is and we, we have an idea on how to fulfill that need, but what we've come up with doesn't actually, has unintended consequences or doesn't actually address the need that we've identified. And that's why we test. So we'll come up with a feature. Uh, we'll test it with a segment of our buyers. So maybe 50% of the buyers see this feature and 50% don't. And then we measure uh, the the change in buyer behavior between those two groups of people. Mm -hmm. If it looks like we're, we're, things are going as expected and we're meeting the need, we launch that as a new feature. Everybody sees that, and we move on to the next need. If we don't, we 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 take a step back and we say, what's wrong with this feature? Why is it not succeeding? Right? And then we'll change it, and then we'll launch a new version of that, and we keep going through that process until we have a solution and we've met the need. And then from a confidence, confidence standpoint, we're basically we're testing because we want to gain confidence in what we're doing. And one thing we think 
about a lot, and not to take it to a cheesy place, but in the words of Spider Man and Bumble, uh, with great power comes great yeah. <laughs> great, great responsibility. And I think we really understand that we have to be very careful when we're making these decisions on whether or not we should be testing. And we're just doing that because we really want to make sure we're super, super confident before we actually ship something to the site. Yeah. I've, I've been at Etsy now for four years, and I've noticed a shift in um, the last year and a half or so that. We're more judicious about when we test. We test when we really need to do it. We prototype when it works that way. And so um, totally. I hope sellers have felt it because I've definitely right. noticed a difference there. Um, let's see. I mean, can you give me an example of a time that we went through a test and like kind of walk us through what the process was? Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, so a good example of this is the category navigation. And um, this rolled out in July of this year, and it's the it's the the list of categories that we show at the top of the website. People had some feelings about that. They did, yeah, and I will yeah. talk about those feelings. <laughs> okay. um, so, so the the purpose of that was, or why we decided to implement that was, we were going through user research, um, and we discovered that buyers, especially those that are new to Etsy, didn't actually understand what we had for sale. Right? They'd see a few items on the homepage. But that wasn't really representative of all the great, unique items that we have for sale. Um, and uh, we, based on that feedback, we we did a bit more user research where we just tested out and, and like put pictures in front of people and said, if we were to show you the main categories that we have on the site, would this help you understand what we have so for sale? So it's user better? research with fewer people before it went. Right. Okay. So it's like ten people one day. We sit down with them, show them a few pictures, maybe a prototype that they can touch, um, and and. Just by putting the categories that we have on Etsy at the top of the page, understanding was uh, uh, dramatically better on what Etsy actually is and what we sell. Uh, and understanding is important and, and a key thing, uh, especially for new buyers, because they want to know, is this site for me? Does this site have things that I want to buy? Mm -hmm. And if they don't think so, they're just going to leave. Um, so based on that user research, we developed the new category navigation. Uh, and we tested it, it was successful, and we launched it in July, as I said. Uh, but that wasn't the end of the story. Uh, after we launched it, we started hearing um, uh, feedback on the forums that sellers weren't really happy with the way that the, the navigation behaves. So it behaves, the version we launched, when you mouse over it, put your mouse over it, it expands and shows you more categories, mm -hmm. right? And they were asking, why didn't we do it? Uh, why didn't we make it so you have to click to make it expand? Because in some instances, it was covering up some parts of the page unintentionally that they were trying to look at. So based on that seller feedback, we quickly uh, developed a new version of it that was click to expand rather than hover to expand. And we ran an experiment over a two-week period. Um, at the end of the experiment, uh, the results showed that buyers uh, preferred the hover to expand version. Um, so yeah. less people were actually clicking through. Yeah, and less people were buying things on the on the click version of it, right? So at the end of the day, we had to make a difficult decision. We had heard the feedback, and we really wanted to satisfy the sellers that were giving us that feedback. But at the end of the day, our job as the buyer experience team is to optimize the site for buyers so that they buy more things and get more money into the pockets of our sellers, right? So we made the decision to go with them. Um, I think it's it's always, I, I hope there will be, I mean, I hope we can use this as a way to sort of um, report back to sellers on why we made particular decisions. Because I, I feel like hearing why we did certain things is so helpful. Right. I think it just gives a lot of, a lot of great context. Um, let's see, so sellers are obviously curious about what we build to help shoppers connect with and purchase um, products. What changes were made to Etsy search in 2015? And one thing I just want to say quickly is that next time, next fireside chat, we'll have Jamie Delang, who's the head of search, um, to answer even more specific search questions. Yeah, so. Jamie has all the knowledge. So, yeah. um, but I, I actually think the thing that we we changed in search is not so much um, the way that search looks or behaves, mm -hmm. but actually the categories uh, that power search. So in late 2014, we. we rolled out a new way to categorize your items. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the reason we did that was um, in the under the old category structure, there were categories that were based on uh, what the item actually was. Mm -hmm. There were also categories that were based on who the item was for. Uh, and there were also categories based on the material that the item is made of, um, which I think is great from a seller's perspective, right? It gives you a lot of flexibility on where to put your items. 
Um, but we found through user research on the virus side that this these differences in the way that we define the categories was really confusing. For buyers. For buyers, right. So when they would come to the site, they wouldn't know where to look to find the items that they were looking for. And um, if, they, if they don't know where to look, they're not going to look. And then they don't end up buying anything. So in order to create a better buyer experience and encourage more buyers to find the items that they're looking for, we created a consistent uh, uh, set of categories that are primarily focused on what this item is for. That's how buyers are expecting it to see it, or expecting to see it, so we decided to go down that path. And um, we rolled the new taxonomy, which is what we call the group of categories, out in early 2015 and seeing good results. Okay. Um, so, I mean, some sellers wondered why we made those changes, because they could be a drastic difference for, for some folks. Can you talk about a little bit, a little bit more about why you made that decision? Yeah, for sure. So um, the like I talked about, it was a, a good change to orient uh, our buyers to what we have for sale on Etsy. Uh, and we saw, just like the, the metrics we saw right after we did that, uh, were encouraging. Uh, but even more than that, this was a foundational change to the way that we, that we um, use categories on the site. And putting in the effort to change the foundation has actually enabled us to do uh, a lot of things which have even uh, have enhanced the buyer experience even more. Uh, an easy, great example of that is the category navigation, which I was just talking about. Mm -hmm. That would not have been possible with right. the old category system. We had to first start by getting everything into the right categories and then putting layers on right. top of it so that buyers can link through it. And that's, that's something we do a lot on different, both on the seller side yeah. and the buyer side. I think that can be very opaque to sellers. Is we don't, we can't always say, well, here are the next 10 things that are coming, but usually there's a sort of stepping stone thing that happens when we're working on these things. So by working on Taxonomy changes, yeah. it opened the door for a whole suite of changes. Same with you know some of the things we build on the seller side, like the listings manager. Um, it's a lot easier for our team to actually make changes on those pages now yeah. that we took the time to rebuild them. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I mean as you said, I think it's I think it's really challenging for sellers to um, to to deal with these changes when they don't have context on where it's headed. And I know sure. you know you can't necessarily say, so it just makes it it makes it tough to be able to, to communicate it. Um, Let's see. Okay, so I have a question from Anna of RT Loire, book binding in Portugal. The recent changes to search results in Australia and the UK are concerning in many ways from a seller point of view. It negatively affects all sellers who are not from those um, countries since we're no longer on the same level playing field and this impacts search results and positioning and no amount of tweaking of SEO will have any influence. What data made you change, uh, choose this kind of change instead of simply making filters more visible? How will you know you're not effectively harming other seller shops and their customer base and income with this kind of choice? That's a question. Sure. Yeah. yeah, good question. Um, and one of the concerns I heard from Anna there was that um, SEO is no longer important. Uh, and before jumping into the rest of the question, I just want to say SEO is very important still. With this change, we're not, um, we're not removing non-UK and non-Australian listings from search. Um, we're just giving uh, the location of the item a bit more weight than we were previously. So optimizing your items to be uh, to have good SEO uh, is still very critical to the success of your business. So tags and titles are still important. Definitely. Still get found. Location is just one factor in our search algorithm. It is not the only factor. Cool. And then also for sellers watching too, just for more context on SEO, I know that that like, concept can be really hard for people to understand. We have a ton of articles and, and basically guidance on how to optimize your listing for SEO uh, that you can find on the seller handbook. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. there was another point in, in, in there um, that Anna raised, which is a great one about, about filters. Like, why didn't we just make the filters more prominent? Uh, that's a great suggestion. And that's actually something that we tried earlier in the year. Uh, we tried it a few times. and. It turns out that uh, that doesn't actually change buyer behavior very much. And uh, the underlying reason for that. So hi, everyone. I apologize. We had a little break in the middle. Um, we had some technical issues. It gave us a, time to, uh, a little bit of time to, to chat and swap tips about flying with infants. Um, so I think we, I just wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about filters, the end of the question around filters. I think that's the part that we missed on camera. So if you could talk a little bit about why we decided not to do Filters yeah, on sure. Search. Um, <clears throat> we actually uh, decided not to do filters based on data. So 
That was a, a really great suggestion by Anna. Um, we had tried that out earlier in the year, making mm -hmm. the search filters more prominent. And it turned out that it didn't actually affect or change buyer behavior at all. Uh, and we think the, the primary reason for this is that when buyers come to the site, they expect the experience to be localized or personalized for them already. Yeah. And we've seen that when we do that, um, we buyers' behavior does change significantly. Cool. Um, okay, thank you both for being here. I have just a couple of quick things I want to add as well. Um, today, Etsy's VP of International, Nicole Vanderbilt, posted a write-up providing more insight into our international strategy and a little bit more context around um, local search changes, and that's in the Etsy Seller Handbook. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we know there are a lot of questions, um, more specific questions around search, so we'll be joined in the November Fireside Chat by Jamie DeLang, so it's two weeks from today. Um, she's going to answer your questions. Um, one more reminder, if you're interested in applying to be on our Seller Advisory Board, please visit the Seller Handbook. Um, and if you have specific questions about the seller tools in your shop, please feel free to email the support team at etsy.com slash help. I have one more question. What was your first concert? Ooh, mine was New Kids on the Block. Oh, God. Kids on the Block. I had no idea. The first one I can remember is Creed, which is embarrassing. Oh, but... I feel so old when I play this <laughs> game at Etsy. Um, mine was uh, Striper and White Lion in 1987. Mm -hmm. Heavy metal. I had big bangs. Um, and there was one question from um, Rachel of Pacific Crest Silver in the U.S. Um, she said, nice touch with the spirit animals. However, I'm waiting to hear what Heather's is. Um, mine is a lion. I think the mothers are very protective of their cubs, and they have really good hair. So that would be my, my answer. <laughs> so thanks, everyone, for joining. And if you have questions about search, please go ahead and post on our Facebook page. Thanks a lot. Take care.